Occasionally, you will find that during periodic testing or troubleshooting, a picture is worth a thousand meter measurements. The oscilloscope provides us with a graphic representation of the input signal, its waveform, frequency, amplitude, and so on. Let's first briefly review the scope's operating principles. A cathode ray tube, or CRT, contains an electron gun, which produces a beam of electrons to cause the phosphor-coated face of the tube to glow. Horizontal and vertical deflection plates receive signals which make the beam move across the CRT's face. A built-in sweep generator supplies sawtooth waveforms to the horizontal deflection plates, so producing a horizontal line across the screen. The input voltage signal which we wish to observe is presented to the vertical deflection plates. The end result a graph of time versus voltage appears on the CRT screen. Let's take a look at the front panel controls and set up the scope for operation. This particular model is the typical two-channel non-storage scope. Let's say we turn the power switch on but no trace appears. First verify that the selector switch is on channel one as this is the channel we will be using. We look at the triggering section on the panel and observe that the auto norm control is in the norm mode. Aha! In this position, the vertical input, that is the measured signal, is used to trigger the sweep generator. But no signal has been applied yet, so we must select the auto mode. This allows the sweep generator to run free. The horizontal trace should be present now but perhaps it is off the screen or maybe too dim to see. Adjust the horizontal position and vertical position controls to the center of their range. Increase the intensity control, if necessary, for a readable display. A word of caution on intensity, however, if the intensity is left too bright for an extended period, it will burn the CRT's phosphor coating permanently. Remember to use only enough intensity to view the display comfortably, and then turn it down when you're not using the scope for long periods. Now, the focus control can be adjusted for a clean, crisp trace. In order to apply a vertical input signal, we must connect a probe to the scope's vertical input socket. Before applying the voltage signal, check the scope and probe specifications for maximum voltage rating. Remember that the instrument is receiving a peak-to-peak -peak voltage magnitude, which for a sine wave is 2.828 times the root mean square value. Also, check the range multiplier on the probe. Most oscilloscopes generate an internally calibrated signal source, typically a one volt square wave oscillating at one kilohertz. Connecting this known signal to the input probe allows us to observe the display and make calibration adjustments. The screen grid is marked off in centimeters. First, adjust the vertical sensitivity for 0.5 volts per centimeter. Notice that the vertical sensitivity control has an adjustable potentiometer which varies the deflection. Turn this control clockwise to the cal or calibrate position for accurate volt measurements. Now, let's adjust the time division control for 0.5 milliseconds per centimeter for a measurable scale. This control can be used to change the sweep generator's frequency from seconds to nanoseconds per centimeter in order to observe a wide range of frequencies, say 1 hertz to 100 megahertz. This control also has a variable potentiometer which must be set in the cal position for accurate time measurements. At first, the waveform may be jittery or unstable. To improve this, we can adjust the trigger level and slope, positive or negative. You will also have to place the auto norm trigger mode in the normal position now that we have an input signal. So let's see what the display is telling us. In the vertical direction, we see 2 centimeters times 0.5 volts per centimeter, which equals 1 volt. 
This indicates one volt positive with respect to chassis ground. In the horizontal direction, we see that from leading edge to leading edge, one cycle of the waveform covers two centimeters. Multiplying this by 0.5 milliseconds per centimeter equals one millisecond per cycle. This gives us 1,000 cycles per second, or one kilohertz. On some occasions, you may notice that the square wave's leading edges appear to be rounded or overshooting. To provide a clean square wave, we can vary the probe's frequency compensation adjustment. So we have now checked and adjusted the scope's accuracy and are now ready to start actual testing. Assume that a substation's solid-state equipment has been acting strangely and you are called to investigate. One possibility is that the equipment's power supply filter circuit has degraded and excessive AC ripple is interfering with the solid-state equipment's operation. You set up the scope and make the connections to look at the waveform of the DC supply. Beware! Plugging the scope's three-prong power supply plug directly into a normal AC receptacle connects its chassis to ground. This also effectively grounds one side of the incoming signal. So what is the problem? Well, substation batteries and telephone circuits as well are deliberately isolated from ground. So the capacitance between the DC cables and ground cause ground to be at a potential halfway between the positive and negative feeds, say 62.5 volts DC. Now as soon as the grounded scope chassis is connected to the equipment under test, this capacitance discharges through whatever components the reference lead is connected to and can cause catastrophic failure. This could include an unwanted trip as well as extensive troubleshooting and repair time. On a telephone circuit, it may cause common mode voltages to be coupled to the phone line via the scope, perhaps disrupting SCADA communications or causing unexpected operation on a pilot protection scheme. Whenever making tests on solid state or telephone equipment, be sure to use some form of isolation, such as this input isolator so as to isolate the scope probe from ground. To continue our test then, as you decrease the volts division switch to obtain more sensitivity, the trace disappears off the top of the screen, and the vertical position control cannot bring the trace back to the screen. Aha! Here is the problem. We find this AC-DC coupling selector switch in the DC position. If we throw it to the AC position, a DC blocking capacitor is inserted in series with the input signal, so that only the AC component appears on the screen. We can now measure an AC signal in hundredths of a volt, even though it is riding on a 125 volt DC level. Of course, if we're measuring a voltage which has a ground reference, then isolation is not needed. In this example, we are testing a time delay over current ground relay. We find that the actual time current curve does not follow the manufacturer's instruction book curves. Is the test set distorting the waveform? Or is the relay itself in trouble? If only we could view the current waveform to find out. Well, we can, using a Hall effect probe. You will remember that in segment A, the Hall effect clamp-on current probe was discussed for use with a digital multimeter. It turns out that this probe, because it converts a current input to a voltage output, works fine with an oscilloscope. You simply clamp it onto a current wire feeding the relay and connect its output terminals to the vertical input of the oscilloscope. As you start increasing the test current, you will see a clean sine wave at low currents. But as current increases, the wave shape starts resembling the surface of the moon. This visual proof tells you that the relay is indeed receiving distorted waveforms from the test set. And the test setup must be changed in order to achieve correct test results. The manufacturer's curves are based upon pure 60 hertz current. Here is another practical example of the oscilloscope, testing a phase comparison relay. The manufacturer's instruction book tells you to adjust the symmetry of a squaring amplifier 
whose input is a 60 hertz current signal from a line breaker's current transformers. You can obtain the waveform on the scope and adjust the appropriate potentiometer for equal on and off times of 8.33 milliseconds each. A regular multimeter could not give you the necessary picture for such a precise adjustment. The phase comparison relay also needs a propagation delay adjustment to delay the local CT signal to exactly match the CT signal from the line's remote end. Here is where a two-channel scope enters the arena. Let us look again at the scope's vertical input section. We see a display selector switch for channel 1, channel 2, CHOP, and ALT. We have been using channel 1 only until now. Let's connect another probe to the channel 2 vertical input and select the CHOP mode. CHOP causes the two vertical traces to time share at a rate of about 250 kilohertz. This mode is preferred for measuring signals up to 100 kilohertz. To continue, connect the local CT signal to channel 1 and the remote CT signal to channel 2. Position the vertical position control for a convenient overlap and adjust the propagation delay pot for exact phase angle coincidence. The ALT mode is selected when measuring very high frequency signals. This causes the traces on channels 1 and 2 to alternate. At high frequencies, this is not noticeable, but it can cause an irritating flicker at lower frequencies, thus the CHOP selection. Up until now, we've been using a conventional non-storage scope. This is fine for repetitive waveforms. But at times, you may need to view a one-shot occurrence such as a digital message or trip signal which will fly by too fast. In this case, some form of image storage is required. This particular storage oscilloscope is the variable persistence type. Select the variable persistence mode on the non-storage push button to get to the storage mode. Push the erase button to remove any residual storage screen mesh charges. Select the single sweep button to prevent wipeovers. The ready light should come on, signifying the scope is armed and ready to trigger on the next vertical signal. First, make some trial runs to preset the trigger and positioning controls. Apply the input to the stage. One sweep should write across the screen. Immediately push the save button to capture the event. You can then make observations at your leisure. In recent years, the digital storage scope has been developed. It contains a microprocessor and digital memory so that a waveform can be digitized and stored as binary data. The waveform, or several waveforms, can be recalled, expanded, and manipulated as necessary in order to make whatever measurements are needed. These instruments are available with liquid crystal displays and are battery powered so avoiding the chassis grounding problem that we get with AC-powered scopes. You have undoubtedly noticed that there are a lot more scope controls than we have discussed. However, we have attempted to cover the most commonly used controls here. But for complete mastery of your particular scope, you must study the operating instructions and practice using the controls. For now, let's take a well-deserved break. Please, turn off the tape review your workbook, and answer the self-study questions. And when you're ready, begin the next segment.